Good morning. Let's go ahead and start this morning worshiping the Lord. Praise is rising, eyes are turning to you, we turn to you, hope is stirring, hearts are yearning for you, we long for you because when we see you we find strength to face the day in your presence all our fears are washed away washed away God who saves us, worthy of all our praises, Hosanna, Hosanna, come have your way among us, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. all our praises. Hosanna, Hosanna, come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, worthy of all our Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. O hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain, O God. 
you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things hallelujah god above it all hallelujah god unshakable hallelujah you have done great things you've done great things oh hero of heaven you conquered the grave you free every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things. You have done great things. Oh God, you do great Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you, we live for you, holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up my eyes in wonder, show me who you are and fill me with your heart and song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we 
could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Here I am to bow down. Here I 
1 Corinthians 13, 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am only a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. And I'd like to preach for a while this morning from the subject, the tongues of men and angels. Father, we thank you for this time together this morning, Lord. I pray that you'll help me to teach accurately what you it is that you want to communicate to us today. I pray, God, for each of us to really be prompted by your spirit to understand your word and, and what it is that you have for us, Lord, how we can apply it to our lives, uh, that we might know you better, Lord, and, and serve you better and serve those around us better. So, God, we pray today for your spirit to be in charge of everything. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to speak on the topic of tongues. And I know that there's probably plenty of people that would rather I not. Um, the reason I really felt like I should address it is because last week we talked about the, the uh, qualified by the Spirit, that the disciples realized that people were, were saved, especially the Gentiles, because there was that question, just like the Gentiles need to follow the law and all this after they've come to Jesus. And the reason that they knew they were saved because they were said they were filled with the Spirit, and they knew they'd been filled with the Spirit because they did what? They spoke in tongues. Now, <clears throat> I don't. How how many of you? How many of you um, think Paul was a great man of God? Think Paul was a great man of God? You think he knew what he was talking about? Do you think that he wrote Scripture? Okay, if you struggle with tongues, I, I got some bad news for you. Paul said that he wishes that you all spoke in tongues. We'll get to that. Uh, I will say this, I don't care, okay? Paul, I'm not saying it's not important. I'm just saying I'll leave that between you and God. That's what I'm saying. But that's what Paul says. It, it is, and the reason I have so many notes is because the Bible has so much to say about it. And we act like it's not there. Um, it, most Christian churches in this country today, not in other places in the world, but in this country, practice what is known as a cessationist theology on this point. Meaning that, yes, we believe it's there in the Bible because we clearly see it. We see it, uh, we see it demonstrated. We see it used. But we don't believe it's for today. It reached a point for its purpose was fulfilled and it stopped. I'm going to hopefully obliterate that idea. I've done it, showed you in the past. Um, it's just a topic that's difficult and we'd rather not deal with it, I think. Um, so it's easier to say, well, I believe, I, I, I have a cessationist viewpoint on it. I believe it was biblical. I believe God used it, but I don't believe that there's a need for it any longer, so, so God stopped its practice. Um, like I said, it doesn't, I, I'm not so concerned about that. I'm more concerned about are we obedient to the Holy Spirit? I'm a lot more concerned about do we listen to the leading and the instruction and all that of the Holy Spirit than I am, do we speak in tongues, do you speak in tongues? And if you're, if you're curious and maybe you're out there wondering, yes, I speak in tongues. Um, uh, so if you have any questions about what that's all about or how does that happen or what's the, you can, you know, I'd be happy to, to, to answer any questions that you have. Um, there, the Bible gives us reasons for it, on and on and on. Um, and again, I, I'm not, I, I, it doesn't matter to me. I'm more concerned about are you obedient to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. I'll leave that, that whether or not you desire to do that, I'll leave it up to you, between you and God. But, but Paul obviously makes it clear that he thinks, it, it's, it's interesting that Paul makes it clear that he thinks that he wants people to, but at the same time, he says there are clearly things that are more important. So, um, it's, Paul writes, and this is interesting too, why do we think that, that God would stop doing something? Paul wrote half the New Testament. 
And of the, of the top three things that he wrote about, grace and faith, one and two by far, you know what the next one is? Spiritual gifts, one of those being tongues. He writes a lot about spiritual gifts. And he talks specifically about the gift of tongues. So if you have the, the, the most prolific writer of the New Testament writing about such a, a topic so frequently, why would we think that it would have stopped in, say, 300 or 350 A.D.? What, what would be the point of making it, you know, a part of such a prominent part of the Bible if God was just going to stop it so early on in the life of the church? Um, it doesn't make much sense to me. So anyways, let's get into this. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 1 and 2. 1 Corinthians 14, 1 and 2. It says, follow the way of love. And we open with that. Love is the most important thing. God puts that above everybody else. So he, he, but he put right next to that of, of importance. He says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts. So that would be a question I would ask is, do you eagerly desire spiritual gifts? Paul says you should. Especially the gift of prophecy. Now, prophecy is not as controversial as tongues, but it's plenty controversial. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit. So he's saying here, that prophecy is better than tongues because prophecy speaks to people. When you speak in tongues, you're speaking to God. Now, we're told later on, we'll look at this, we, when we speak in tongues, we're, we're, it's between me and God. Except, unless what? Does anybody know? Unless there's somebody who interprets that tongue, and then everybody can be benefited or edified from that. So, I would also add to this, Tongues is not only speaking just between you and God, it's speaking into the spirit realm. Speaking and praying in tongues is very, very powerful in the spiritual realm. You're doing spiritual warfare, if you will, spiritual battle beyond a level that you have understanding. It is Holy Spirit. It's almost at times like the Holy Spirit is doing one-on-one -on -one battle with the devil. And that's above your pay grade. Hello? It's above your pray grade. We don't know how to address that in our own language, but the Holy Spirit through us does. So it, it's, it's critically important. So, so we see here, eagerly desire, desire spiritual gifts, prophecy especially, but he also addresses tongues here. Um, it, it is communication, he says, between you and God. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 says, Now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. I point this out simply because the American church is really ignorant on spiritual gifts. How, how much do you think that spiritual gifts, gifts of the Spirit, supernatural giftings of the Holy Spirit are taught on in the American church today? You, probably very, very little. You could go to, well, not in this church, but in other churches. Did they? Oh, Darwin's going to get in trouble. He better not let. Oh, Ben? Okay. I was going to say, don't let the, don't let the, the well, actually, I may have mentioned this before, but our new Great Lakes Conference director, he comes from the same background I do, Assemblies of God. I don't know how he got that job. He must have kept that a secret. Anyways, because I know what I went through coming into the churches of God. Um, I'm not saying, it, obviously, there's a Pentecostal element within the American church, but it's certainly in the minority. Um, so, but, and Paul clearly says, hey, I don't want you to be ignorant about this. You shouldn't be ignorant. And so that really is the thrust of why I'm addressing this today, not to get you to speak in tongues necessarily, but so that we not, at least we can say we're not ignorant because Paul says we shouldn't be. So, I want to look, first of all, at several purposes for the gift of tongues. Let's go to Romans 8, verses 26 and 27. And I, and I need, well, I, I probably should do this. I didn't even make this a part of my notes, but I, pro, I just feel like I need to do this before I even go into this. If you go, and I've, you've heard me teach on this before, and that, that's why I didn't really do, put this in my notes. But if you go to, go to Acts, 
Um, If you go to Acts chapter 2, verse 16, it's the day of Pentecost. The sound is the mighty rushing wind went through the place. Little tongues of fire rested on everybody. And the people that the tongues of fire rested on did what? They spoke in tongues. And, and people heard this and they thought, these people must be drunk. This sounds crazy. But Peter stands up and he addresses this. And he says in verse 16, no, this is what. Uh, was spoken by the prophet Joel in my last in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all people, and he says you know your sons and daughters will prophesy your old men will see visions your young men will dream dreams, so he's saying that speaking in tongues and again we've covered this on the day of Pentecost started the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy, and they knew that it was happening because they heard him speaking in tongues. And we'll address that a little bit later too. So. That, he said that's the beginning of it. It's starting that day. And, of course, he goes on and he, he talks and he, he, he gives a time frame of when, it's, how long it's going to last. Um, and he, he uh, I want to make sure. He starts referencing, you know, the, um, I should see, this is, why I, this is why you prepare in advance. Oh, uh, in verse 22, he says, Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did among you through those, uh, as you know yourself. And he goes on and he talks about the, you know, the, the, the moon and the sky and all, all these signs of his coming that he references it, in Matthew about when he's asked, what's the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And he gives them the signs of what's going to happen when he returns. So my point is, I've said before, Peter sets a time frame. It started on the day of Pentecost and it's going to run through the, 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 the activity of the Holy Spirit and his gifts is going to run through until when? Until Jesus returns. Because that's the time frame that Peter gives us. So we're still in that time frame, right? Jesus hasn't shown up at anybody's house, right? I mean, if he has, I'm coming over. Um, so, so we know that we're still in that time frame. So it's important that we understand what is the purpose. If we're still living in that time, then what's the purpose of it? So... Some of the gifts, purposes of the gift of tongues. Romans 8, verses 26 to 27. It says, In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes with groans that, that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. So there's a couple reasons that were given there and a couple really good reasons of why the gift of tongues has been given to us. And I would just say this about all these things. Is it any, is it any different today? Do we need this any less when we are praying and we don't even know how to pray or what we should pray? You're in the middle of crisis. The, your world around you is falling down and you don't know what to do. And you sense maybe it's, a, maybe you just, it's, just, it's just life. Or maybe you really do sense it is an attack of of. Satan and his demons, but how do I fight back against it? It says that he intercedes for us beyond what we're able to express ourselves, okay? I don't know how to attack this. There's something really incredibly bad, negative, tragic, whatever going on in my life, and I don't even know how to address it. Well, who does? God, his spirit, so he intercedes for us on our behalf beyond what we would ever be able to capable to understand or articulate. The Spirit prays through us. And it says, what I love about this in verse 27, he searches our hearts and knows the mind, um, and he who searches the heart knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with whose will? When you're praying, is it better to pray your will or God's will? Better to pray God's will. I have no doubt that when I pray, there's a lot of times I'm praying what Randy wants and what Randy thinks. Amen? I know I'm the only one. You're a lot more spiritual than me. Um, so I'm better off if God prays according to his will rather than my will. If I'm praying in the spirit, 
using the gift of tongues, then I know I'm not praying my will. I'm praying His will. Ephesians 6.18 says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Well, I can't pray all the time. Okay? But you know who can pray all the time through me? Holy Spirit. And I know that he's praying according to God's will. And he's praying for, again, these requests, the, 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 the praying for all the saints. Paul says that we should pray in the Spirit for everyone and everything, basically, is what he's saying. Well, I can't do that, but Holy Spirit can. And it's not even, you doesn't have to be like where you're going to be, you know, in your prayer closet, you know, on your knees praying. But the Spirit in our minds, our minds are always going. If our mind is set on the Spirit, then we can do a lot more praying that way than we can when we just set aside our prayer time. Because like most people I know go, man, I can't pray for more than five minutes. But the Holy Spirit can. And so when we're just, when we make ourselves available to Him, then He can do these things. And Paul says again, basically, if, if, he, if he had his way, we'd be praying all the time for everyone about everything. Again, we can't do that, but Holy Spirit can. Jude 20 says, But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in the most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. We are built up when we allow God's Spirit to pray through us. Again, I can pray... I'm not saying that you have to pray in tongues in order to pray according to what Holy Spirit wants. If you can really hear and understand the Holy Spirit speaking to you, then you certainly can pray in English using your English words, or if you speak some other language additionally, then you can use that language, whatever. I'm not saying, but when I don't, when I, when, when I don't know, you know, and I can't do that, I, I'm not able to clearly discern what, what's going on, then Holy Spirit can take over where I, where I lack that, and he can pray the proper prayer, the prayer that, the prayer that God wants. So, and when we do that, it says it builds us up. We're built up. Build yourself up. We have the ability to build ourselves up when we pray according to what the Holy Spirit wants to pray. 1 Corinthians 14, 4 says, He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. What does the word edify mean? It means what? Build up. We build ourselves up. We edify ourselves. But he who prophesies edifies the church. So here we see, again, another reason for, the tongue, for tongues. It builds us up. We pray in the Spirit. I know I can say this. I feel like I, I feel like my prayers are much more accomplished uh, when I pray in the Holy Spirit as opposed to just praying my own agenda. Um, <clears throat> so when we pray in the Spirit, we build ourselves up. Prophecy builds others up as well because we're speaking to the church as a whole. And tongues does not do that primarily unless there is a gift uh, the gift of interpretation that goes along with it. But again, we see there's a purpose for this. Let me ask you this. If tongues were supposed to have ceased, does that mean that you no longer need built up? You never need built up. You're all just fine all the time. Well, if praying in tongues builds you up, and people still need built up, then why would God put a stop to the gift of tongues? Folks, the reason that people want to have a cessationist view of the gift of tongues is because they're uncomfortable with it. It's not because they're not smart enough to figure this out, because I'm not some kind of super smart person. If I can understand this, and you all know I'm right, then these smart guys can figure it out, amen? They just don't, because it's really, it's really weird. You're all weird enough to begin with. You don't need to start doing something weirder on top of it, amen? It's weird, and it's strange, and we're uncomfortable with it. So it's easier just to say, well, God doesn't do that anymore. I, 
why, why tongues? Why this weird gift? You've heard me say this before, but I believe it's true. If God has two, two things people really struggle with, I've found. Giving money and controlling their tongue. If God has control of your wallet and your tongue, he probably has control of pretty much all of you. Because those are two of the hardest things for us to surrender. So I don't know if that's the answer, but I think, it's, I think there's something to that. 1 Corinthians 14, 22. The tongues then are a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for believers, not for unbelievers. So we see here we're told that tongues is used as a sign. I got, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if unbelievers struggle with somebody praying in tongues any more than believers do. Honestly. They might be more like, hmm, what's that? It's, I just know what the Bible says. I'm going to choose to agree with the Bible. If I don't understand it and I have to make a decision about what I'm going to believe, I'm going to believe the Bible. How's that? Fair enough? So it says that it's a, tongues are assigned to unbelievers. So I got into this in Acts, in Acts uh, 2, that whole chapter about giving, pouring out of tongues. I want to I make a case um, for why I believe that tongues has not ceased. Because here's the deal. The cessationist argument argues it this way. On the day of Pentecost... They all came together, and the Holy Spirit came, and the sound of the, of the wind and the tongues, and they spoke in tongues, and it was really weird. But Peter explained it, and based on his explanation, it says 3,000 people got saved that day. So the argument is, and we also see that it says that there were God-fearing Jews there from a bunch of different nations. So they all spoke different languages. So in order for them to understand, because it says when the, when the gift of tongues was poured out on that day, they all did what? They heard, this, they heard it in their own language. So if there's like, you know, everybody here sitting here spoke a different language, and I was up here speaking, but, but you don't speak English, but I spoke in tongues, you'd all hear it in your own language. That's what's being described. It's not like I'm speaking to you and to you and to you and you and you individually one at a time. I'm saying one thing and you're all hearing it simultaneously in your own language. That's what's being described. So the argument for cessation is that it was used as an evangelistic tool for all these people who spoke different languages. It was a miracle. And it's a miracle of hearing every bit as much as it is a miracle of speaking. Here's the problem with that. Just because they all spoke different languages, they all come from different nations, doesn't mean they didn't have commonality of language. Because, for the for example, the Bible itself is written in Hebrew, Greek, and some Aramaic, and a little bit of Chaldean. Okay? People, and today in Europe, if you live in Europe, good chances are you speak more than one language, as it was with the case of these people. They often spoke several languages. They had commonality in language oftentimes. But not only that, it says one very, very critical thing. And I made this case to our conference director one time, and uh, he knew I was right. And he <laughs> they were all God-fearing Jews. What do Jews have in common besides a religious belief? They have a language in common. They speak Hebrew. So if these men were all God-fearing Jews, then they, I can just about promise you 100% of them, they spoke Hebrew. They didn't, so what's my point? They did not need tongues in order to communicate to all of them simultaneously. Do you get my point? That kind of shoots that idea, that excuse. See, these are theologies. When somebody is developing, when we, when we have theologies and doctrines, it's not saying they're wrong, but oftentimes there are things that we, that we develop to explain something that the Bible doesn't explicitly say. Like the Bible does not explicitly say that that's what tongues was used for on the day of Pentecost. But we, that theology is developed because it helps us explain something that we are uncomfortable with. 
and that we'd rather not have to deal with. So a theology is, well, that, that, that's not the case because they all could have communicated, all right? Not only that, it was argue, it's argued in the cessationist view that tongues is used to, in order to do this kind of evangelistic missionary work. But if that's the case, every mission organization I know, if you're going to go on a mission field in some country that you do not speak that language, you know what they do? They send you to language school. Why? Why not just use tongues? That's what, we, that's what you said it was given for in the Bible. I know I'm way too logical. See, when you're, when you're slow intellectually like me, you have to dumb it down and make it simple, all right? But it's true. If, if this is what, if it really is used for what they say it was used for, why do we have all these mission organizations have all these language schools? Because you just do what the Bible did, amen? So when you look at all these, I, when you look at all this, along with the idea, additionally, that Peter sets the time frame when this is going to be in use, starting the day of Pentecost and running until Jesus comes back, I just don't see that you can make an honest case for, uh, for, the, for the gift of tongues having ceased. Because nothing's changed. People still need to be edified. We still need to do spiritual warfare in the spirit beyond what we can do. We need build up all these things. We're not different. We're not people today. We're not different than they were back then. We, we need Jesus just as much. Chris? I don't see any, I don't, I'm not aware of in scripture anywhere that that is the case. The Bible makes it clear that the gift of tongues is clearly a gift of Holy Spirit. It is God's Spirit praying through us. Holy Spirit was not poured out until the day of Pentecost. That's one reason why that's what Joel prophesied that would happen and how you would know it was happening. In the last days, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. And Peter goes, this tongues thing that you're seeing, that's what that is. So, and I don't, I'm, not, I'm not aware of it. it it's, again, um, I, I don't care if you speak in tongues. I'm just, I'm a, lot more in, I'm a lot more concerned that we are obedient to be used by the Holy Spirit the way he wants to use us on a daily basis. To listen to him and, folks, and it's not just tongues. It's all kinds, of, there's a whole bunch of other gifts. This is just the one we get hung up on. Keely? No, it does not. But here, here's, she asked, if someone is speaking in tongues, does there always have to be an interpreter, an interpretation? The answer is no. And the Bible tells us this. I, I, I honestly don't remember if I have that in there in my notes or not. But I'll describe it like this. When we're up here in worship sometimes, during worship, I will pray in tongues. I, you don't hear me because I do it quietly. Okay? Because, because it's not for everybody. It's just me. It's between me and God. Okay? Now, if I believed that there was a message for the church and there was going to be an interpretation, I would raise my voice so that everybody would hear me and know that I had a message for the church. And I would do that, and then there better be an interpretation or I was wrong and I should have kept my mouth shut. I mean, that's basically what the Bible teaches us. Now, I could have been wrong if I do that, if there's no interpretation, or somebody has the interpretation and they're afraid to speak it out. And that happens too. There are actually, I actually had a, a gentleman in my last church, his name was Ben Mills. He was a postman. And Ben uh, was telling me about one time that he was in a, a service in Santa Barbara where he uh, gave a message in tongues and, and, and Ben did that from time to time and there was usually an interpretation. Um, and there was a guy in the, there uh, that was a part of U, uh, UC Santa Barbara professor of, of languages or whatever. And so he, he came up to Ben, who heard this after the service, and asked me, he goes, he goes when did you learn to speak um, Mandarin? How do you know how to speak Mandarin? And Ben goes, I have no idea what you're talking about, man. I speak English, and I do that poorly, you know. And the guy goes, well, what you were speaking was Mandarin. 
perfect. So I don't think Bill, I don't think Ben was making that one up. Um, apparently there was somebody there that spoke manner that needed to hear that. So Our hang-up on tongues, I think, sometimes is like we over it, it gets overemphasized. Within the Pentecostal church, which I was a part of as an Assembly of God minister for 17 years, um, I think that it's, I would just tell you the truth, I think it's overemphasized. See, here's the point. It's either over, here's the problem we have as human beings. We either overdo something or we ignore it altogether. We can never get that pendulum in the middle where it belongs, Okay. Because one side makes their argument, and to make their argument, they go hard, right? And they pull the pendulum all the way over there. And the people that disagree with them, they got to make their counterpoint just as hard, and they pull the pendulum all the way over here, where the, it belongs in the middle somewhere, all right? It's only one of the listed nine gifts that we know of, that we're, we're sure of. Now, the Bible, and a lot of people believe there are more than nine gifts. They add to the nine gifts, administration and leadership and hospitality, and even celibacy. Um, so there, there, but we know specifically listed, there are at least nine gifts of the Spirit. And of those, you could say that tongues is what? One ninth, right? So it can be overdone. They, the Pentecostal church believes that speaking in tongues is the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, I think you can make a really good case for that. But honestly, I don't care about that. I'm more concerned about what I call the, the um, not the initial evidence, but maybe, um, I don't know, the most significant evidence. Uh, and that is power to live for God. Power to be obedient to him and live for him and do the things that he is leading us to do. I'm much more concerned about that. Like on where it says uh, in Acts 1.8, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Power to what? Power to be a witness. Well, I'm more concerned about the power that we have in our lives in order to live for God and be a witness for him than simply just speaking in tongues. Does that mean that we shouldn't desire or pursue speaking in tongues? No, because Paul says it's important. It builds you up. It can build up others. And it is, uh, he wishes that we did it. He wishes everybody. He says, I wish, he says, I wish you would all speak in tongues. So it can be overemphasized many, you know, it, but, it, but it doesn't mean just because the one side pulls it too far, maybe one way, the other side pulls it too far the other way, there's somewhere in the middle. As uh, in the Pentecostal church, I know I'm, I'm sure I've shared this before, they always have this idea that sometimes people... Because what happens is in the gifts of the Spirit and the moving of the Holy Spirit is that people get their own emotions and their own desires involved. And it gets goofy. It gets off track. And so and it, gets, it can be out of control. And of course, we look at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as when the tongues of fire came, right? The fire of God came. So the expression is, well, I'd rather have wildfire, meaning... The Holy Spirit's working, but some people are excessive and it gets out of control. I'd rather have wildfire than no fire. Well, my, my question has always been, why are those my only two options? I mean, again, we pull the pendulum way over here, we pull it way over here. How about we have a controlled burn? How's that? In other words, Holy Spirit's at work, but it's under the control of the Holy Spirit, not us, where we get too carried away or whatever. It is can get and that's why people don't like to talk about Holy Spirit is because it can get out of control because people start claiming everything it, they they use well the Spirit led me to do it or the Spirit asked me to do it or the Holy Spirit's doing this or the Holy Spirit's doing that and they can justify any behavior because they just blame it on the Spirit and so it has become the position of most churches in, the, in, in America to just not do any of it, just, just ignore it. Well, why don't we teach a controlled burn instead? And that was Paul. If you read Paul's letters to the Corinthians, he says, it's very clear, you're a very spiritually gifted church, but you're very spiritually immature. That's pretty well descriptive of most churches. 
spiritually gifted but spiritually immature. But you know what his answer was? He didn't say because you're being immature in the way you're handling the Holy Spirit, then stop doing it all together. He doesn't say that. You know what he says? Let me teach you how to do it right. But the church has pretty much abdicated that completely. We don't try to do that at all. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is give, given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom, to another the message of knowledge by the, same, uh, by the means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still to others the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of of one and the same Spirit, and He gives them to each one just as He determines. So we see in this passage, gifts of the Spirit listed. And we see that they are uh, all gifts of one and the same Spirit. And they're given for the common good of the entire church body. And it says that they're given as the Holy Spirit determines. So. To one person, we may have a priority of gift of prophecy. To another, it may be healing. To another, it may be distinguishing of spirits. He gives the gifts based on his determination. However, I would say this in just one point is that Paul says when it comes to tongue, he says what? I wish that you would all speak in tongues. Because it's not, because uh, for a lot of people, why would, I, I this is my understanding of what Paul's saying. For a lot of people, they will never use the gift of tongues publicly. See, that's what I was describing earlier. When I pray softly, that's private. That's just me and God. And then there's the public, which is when you have an interpretation. Most people will never be used in public gift of tongues with an interpretation. It's just private. Well, if it's private, mostly, then why wouldn't everybody need that? Because it does what? It edifies us. It builds us up. So, every, so Paul's point is, I wish that you would all do that because you can all benefit by being edified and built up. It doesn't mean that you're going to give a message in tongues with an interpretation for the whole church body, okay? That's something that, that uh, but, but we can all be edified in and of ourselves. Um, but it is the Holy Spirit that gives the, gives the gifts. We're not going to go get the one that we specifically want. That's up to the Holy Spirit. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 12, 14 through 20. Yeah, I don't even know. Let me ask you this. If I don't get through this today, which I won't, do you want me to finish it next week or have you had enough tongues already? First Corinthians 12, 14 through 20. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot says, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not be for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not be it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the same uh, the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. Back to the idea that the Holy Spirit gives the gifts. If they, want, if they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. So again, I, I just point this out to say all these gifts that are listed, including the gift of tongues with and without interpretation, are all necessary body parts. They're all important. There is no unimportant in parts of our body. Amen? I mean, nobody here, I mean, has anybody got an unimportant, does anybody here have an unimportant body part right now that we can just come up, you can just come here and we'll just chop it off? You don't need it. Right? They're all important, right? And so, we need to be careful because when we, say that the, that when we say that the gift of tongues is no longer in operation, or in other words, have a cessatious theology, we're saying that body part was no longer important. So God just chopped it off. Well, that's not what the problem is, is the Bible says something different. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 through 31. 
Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And in the church, God has appointed, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, and workers of miracles, and also the, those uh, having the gift of healing, those able to help others with gifts of administration, and, the, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But eagerly desire the, the greater gifts. So here we see Paul gives a list of spiritual gifts. Tongues are a part of it. And he says, yes, they are all important. This, this is all, and this is, this is now approximately 50 years after the day of Pentecost, when, the, when it was poured, the gifts, uh, when the Holy Spirit was poured out with the evidence of tongues. So 50 years down the road, Paul is still saying what? It's still important. It hasn't become any less important. It's still a part of the body. Everybody has a gift to offer. And look at this. We can think about, we understand, it. like if somebody prays for somebody and they get healed, well, God used that person with a supernatural gift of healing. If they give a gift of, if somebody gives a prophecy and it really just rings true with everybody, it's like, we know that was God speaking, yay. We all accredit that to God and the Holy Spirit. But, you know, and we, we recognize that. But in this passage, Paul equates Tongues is not something lesser. It's not lesser than miracles. It's not lesser than healings. It's not lesser than the gift of prophecy. He equates it. It's right there with all the other gifts. It's not a lesser gift to just be done away with after 50 years or 300 years. He says they're all still important. And not only that, he says to what? Eagerly desire. Now, I don't know which ones are the greater gifts. You have to study more to, to figure that out but they're all important and we suffer when we lack a gift we lack a body part and if we lack a body part then our body is less than whole and healthy we're missing something and so the church to a great extent is missing part of itself part of its body by thinking that this is no longer important and God no longer does this. I want, now I need to figure out where I want to stop. Um, well, this, is a good, this would be a good place to stop, I guess. 1 Corinthians 12, 31 through 13, uh, through, uh, 13 3. It's kind of where we started. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 12, 31a says, And now I will show you the most excellent way. 13.1. If I speak in the tongue of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have the, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all possessions to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. I don't want to stop. So, what's my point? In all of these gifts, tongues included, what should be the guiding principle behind their usage? Based on what I just read, love. <clears throat> Sometimes people that I, having come from the Pentecostal background, you see people operate in the gifts of the Spirit, that they get so excited and enamored, if you will, about the gift of the Spirit to how God uses them they forget the love part. When we use, when, when Holy Spirit is working through us, you know that God's doing it because he loves us. If we aren't motivated by love and the use of those gifts too, then we're really missing something. Because I promise you, God is operating in, God is operating via Holy Spirit through us because he loves us. And so we need to always be motivated by love too. Here's the danger, and again, why people, a lot of pe people in churches want to avoid talking about the gifts of the Spirit. Because people that operate in the gifts of the Spirit, it's like it becomes their identity. That thing becomes their identity. Such as somebody who prophes who's God's given, and he uses that person in the gift of prophecy. People start referring to them as, guess what? A prophet. And that becomes their identity. Rather than just a child of God 
who is going to love people the way God loves them, and however God wants to use them to do that, that's what they do. It's like that, that label of a gift that, they, that God uses them becomes more important than anything else. And that's an improper balance. Everything that we do in the gifts of the Spirit, I mean, if, if, if you are to receive and or use the gift of tongues, if it's motivated by love, God's love, how would it be wrong to use it? How would it be wrong to have it? If we speak in the tongues of men, which is what we do most of the time, but even if we speak in the tongue of angels, God's spirit praying in us and through us, if it's not motivated by love, God's not that pleased with it. That's the most important thing. Amen?